All right, guys, you are listening to Pop Culture Network Radio here on PopCultureNetwork.com. And today is September 27th, 2013. We've got a fun show for you today. We've got some, you know, toy news, some comic news, all of that kind of stuff that you've come to expect on this kind of show. But additionally on that, we're going to talk a little bit about TNA Wrestling. Now, I know some of you are thinking, what, TNA Wrestling? Isn't that like the worst wrestling in the world? Actually, it's not. And that's uh, part of the reason why we're going to talk about it today. Also, just because there are a couple people on Facebook asked me about it. Uh, There's this one guy, calls himself Andre the Midget, lives in Finland. And uh, he's big in wrestling. He wanted to hear some thoughts about TNA. So we're going to humor him. Uh, We're going to do this up, talk a little bit about TNA wrestling. But don't worry, we'll save that for the end. So you guys who are not wrestling fans, at least listen to the first part of the show. We're going to talk about some toy news, some comic book news, and things like that. However, before we get into that, we're going to plug some of the stuff we have on the website. Some new material, some original Pop Culture Network goodies that are up there right now. Uh, first off, there is a new episode of Comaholics, episode 36. Uh, and this one, the idea on this one was to talk about... You know, Villains Month, Forever Evil, Battle of the Atom, Infinity, all the big stuff that's going on in the two companies right now. And uh, in order to, you know, celebrate all these big things, we opened a bottle of mead. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with mead, mead is a honey wine. And this honey wine was actually brewed by my co-host on the show, The Apocalypse. Uh, And he, you know, home brews in his basement, does a lot of beer and stuff like that. And he made this mead. And... From what I understand, he put it in his basement uh, to let it ferment and kind of forgot about it for a while. Uh, So it kind of fermented longer than it should have, which upped the uh, alcohol content in it and made it a pretty potent potable. And um, when we started the show, the first segment is, you know, it's, it's our usual stuff. It's okay. And then the second segment kind of gets away from us a little bit. And then the third segment... I don't really remember the third segment all that well. Um, but we, we recorded it. It's there on the show. Uh, but to be honest, I really... Whew, uh, I don't recall a moment of it. So, uh, kind of got away from us there with the honey wine. But some people like that. You know, they like the train wreck television. They like the train wreck podcasting as it is. So, if you want to check that out, Comaholics is up. I need comics.com, part of popculturenetwork.com. Also, again, this week I was on the Comic Book Chronicles with uh, theclicknation.com. Tim Dog is the uh, host of that show, Agent 70 and myself, talking some comic books. Uh, some of the news from, um, you know, the new Gotham TV show uh, we talked about on there. We talked about the uh, first episode of Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, and then also, a review from Shout Factory. They sent us the DVDs for Sapphire and Steel, the complete series. And so I sat down to do that one. And I wanted to kind of, I don't know, just do something special for a change on that one. So, uh, Dirt is back on that one. I know what you're thinking. Wait, you're Dirt. Yes, I am Dirt. But the other Dirt, the masked Dirt, makes his grand reappearance in the Sapphire and Steel DVD review with some um fun special effects so if you want to see the uh glorious return of masked dirt and see my best attempts at doing some uh, really bogus <laughs> special effects you can check that out uh, so make sure you look for all of that good stuff uh, we also have a review of guardians of the galaxy 6 written review from tim dog of the click nation uh, that's the name he chose for himself. I didn't name him that. That's what he did, but, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, some stuff going on in the world of comic books and uh, toys, video games, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a new Art FX statue has been announced. DC Comics Nightwing, the new 52 version with the red, um, you know, W or wings or whatever's on his chest that uh, you want to call that. Uh, They're coming out with the uh, Art FX statue on that. No price listed. I think it's slated for February, uh, but my guess on that one's going to be probably uh, $54.95, $59.95, somewhere in that range. It looks fantastic, except the suit is a little too shiny for my taste. It looks metallic, uh, but they kind of do that on a lot of the Art FX statues, have that metallic look to it. So uh, anyway, there it is, and that'll be cool. We got an announcement from Marvel 
that Ultimate Spider-Man is going to be making his first appearance on the Straight Up Disney Channel. I don't know, did I talk about this last week? This seems real familiar. Maybe I did talk about this one already, but we'll mention it again. Give him another plug, why not? Uh, the Howling Commandos will be making an appearance on this show. This uh, Normally, Ultimate Spider-Man is on uh, Disney XD, so this is going to be the first time on the Straight Up Disney Channel. Um, I think this was breaking news when we recorded last week. I can't remember if I talked about it or not. So, anyway, um, it's going to have uh, Blade. It's going to have Werewolf by Night. It's going to have The Mummy. It's going to have Frankenstein's Monster and Man-Thing. So, look forward to that. It is going to be appearing uh, October 13th at 10 Central. So, if you want to look uh, for a sneak peek, you can find that right now. If you go to iTunes and look up the Marvel Channel, or maybe it's the Disney Channel, I don't remember. On one of those, you can go on there, and you can find that. So, uh, my kids love that show. I don't know if, if you guys are digging that show at all, but they absolutely adore Ultimate Spider-Man. And it's got a female character on there with White Tiger, so uh, that just automatically makes White Tiger my daughter's favorite character of all time. Because you don't normally get a lot of strong female characters uh, in cartoons like that. Uh, we got a press release today, actually. Uh, well, actually, I posted it today. I think I got it a couple days ago, but just now got around to it. Sorry about that. Uh, but 3A Toys is going to be reducing, reducing, releasing the Robot Heavy, a blue and red characters, from Team Fortress 2. Uh, for those of you not familiar with 3A Toys, it's, I don't know if it's run by Ashley Wood or if, just everything is designed by Ashley Wood, uh, but basically, Ashley Wood does all the artwork for this company, and all their designs seem to be based on his artwork, um, and it is, like, super high-end collectibles in generally this kind of funky, um, post-modern style, um, Ashley Wood paints, uh, most of his stuff that he does. Uh, sometimes there's some line work with uh, ink and then paints on top of it. But regardless, uh, all this stuff looks really cool but is super, super expensive. My phone just dinged because I got a text message. I probably need to turn that off. Uh, we'll take care of that here. Um, regardless, um, these Team Fortress 2 characters, as I said, these are high-end collectibles. So $220 per figure, one six scale for red and blue. Or you can buy both of them together in a set. It'll cost you $400. So you're going to save 40 bucks. You save 10% by buying them together. Uh, but these, these are super cool. Uh, fully posable, 12 inches tall, 30 points of articulation, illuminated LED eyes. Um, they include the minigun weapon. Which, if you remember Minigun, I know it sounds like it's going to be something tiny, but it's actually like uh, what Jesse Ventura had in Predator. Uh, that big, like, helicopter gun. Uh, Minigun, let's see, uh, if you order it from Bambaland.com, which is their um, online store, straight from 3A Toys, you get an uh, interchangeable set of blue boxing glove hands. And you will also get a code to unlock something in Team Fortress 2. It doesn't say what it is, just as it's there. Uh, but anyway, if you want to check out the pictures of those, they, they're really cool. Even if you're not going to buy them, I think at least go and take a look at the gallery because these are really super cool looking. $220, that's a toy that's a bit out of my price range, personally. Uh, I know some of you guys don't even think twice about dropping money like that on it. So take a look. Let me know what you think. Uh, some other news here, new video game news. Mutant Football League is teaming up with Football Heroes. Uh, Run Games is the developer be be behind games like uh, Football Heroes. And they are going to be using the game engine to further develop Mutant Football League. This is going to be coming to Windows uh, as a straight download or through Steam. Uh, this is going to be on the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 4, Android, and the um, Apple uh, App Store. So, um, wide array of devices. It's basically, if you think of old video games like Tecmo Bowl or NBA Jam, uh, but, you know, as like a high def. They did a re-release of NBA Jam, I think, last year. Uh, if you saw that, you have an idea of what you're, you know, 
the type of thing you're going to get. Um, but it's also going to have a lot of RPG elements. So you're going to have a lot of stats and things that you can track and you can tweak and you can uh, assign points here or points there to kind of build your characters up. You can run, uh, you know, like seasons. You can play online. Um, no word yet, I don't think... Um, if there's going to be any sort of like cross-platform, I don't know if someone on 360 is going to be able to play against someone on PlayStation. Um, oh, <laughs> on Xbox One and PlayStation 4. Uh, I think it's also going to be on the regular ones, but I'm not sure on that. I'll have to double check. Uh, but anyway, I'm not sure if there's going to be any sort of inner cross-play. If you want to check out more on that, you can go to MutantFootballLeague.com. They are running a Kickstarter. Um, to uh, stand behind Mutant Football League, which you can go check out if you want to throw down on that. And basically, you know, a lot of times with the Kickstarter stuff, you can get kind of a discounted price on getting the game ahead of time or pay some extra bucks and get your name on there as like a, a producer, uh, you know, something like that on the game. Like, uh, normally the game's 10 bucks, but if you pay 100 you can have your name on there as a producer, which seems kind of silly and stupid, but there is something kind of cool about watching a movie and seeing your name in the credits or picking up a comic, finding your name printed in there. Uh, that's one of the fun things about Kickstarter is uh, adding yourself to uh, some of those things. So they have that kind of stuff available. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it just looks like one of those fun kind of old-school arcade-type games uh, a lot of people look forward to. So, uh, let's see. I don't know if there's any other news necessarily we really need to talk about. Um, one thing I say, if you guys want to get into discussions of stuff, if there's something particular you want to talk about, like for instance, today I'm going to be talking about. Um, somebody asked me about it and asked if I could talk about it on the show. So I'm going to do that. So if there's anything similar to that, anything that you want to talk about like that, um, then you know, feel free to send me an email. Find me on Facebook. Find me on Google Plus. Uh, you know, Twitter, whatever. Send me an email, dirt at popculturenetwork.com, and you know, I'll look into it. I'll look into it. See if it's something that we can discuss. If it's something we can talk about. Like uh, last week, for instance, uh, I answered some of the fan core questions uh, that had been left for the show, and the show <coughs> I, I explained on the first week of. Uh, Pop Culture Network Radio, what was up with the show, why you hadn't seen one in a while, and how, uh, you know, plans for that haven't been working out quite as we wanted, and, and what we, you know, everything. So anyway, if you want to find that, find uh, Pop Culture Network Radio from the 13th of September. You can hear all about that. But last week, I answered questions from the fan corner, and uh, Clone Yoshi went ahead into the... Uh, uh, the show spot on the Pop Culture Network forums at jointheforums.com and started a fan corner for this episode. So he's asked a question. I'm going to answer his question. Uh, if you've got something else, you can also go to jointheforums.com, look for the show, and post questions there. And I'll, you know, I'll be more than happy to you know do a little bit of research, look into it, and you know we can discuss the stuff here on the show. So I'm going to open with his question. Clone Yoshi, he says, hey guys, I'm a senior in high school and I'm starting to look at colleges I want to go to. Um, I'm into film, so I'm wondering if you have any tips on applying to colleges, if you know of any decent film schools around there. Well, I can tell you the only school that I know of personally is one that I almost attended, and that's the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And the only reason why I didn't go there, and this was uh, geez, uh, almost 20 years ago after I graduated high school, the only reason I didn't go to the Art Institute of Chicago was simply because we couldn't afford it. Uh, I was not a straight A student, surprise, surprise, in school, and so uh, it was much more difficult for me to get uh, financial aid. Uh, a lot of the cost with going to Art Institute of Chicago come with living in the city because it is right downtown. Like, you were uh, just on the bleeding edge of the Miracle Mile, if you've ever heard of that in Chicago, uh, the great uh, shopping walkway. Like, you can go out of the school, cross the street, and go off into, I think it's Grant Park, right across the street. It's, it's beautiful. Beautiful campus, uh, great school. They gave me a tour. Um, I had a portfolio review with them. Everything looked great, but 
you know, because I was not a straight A student, the financial aid was not the same for me as it as it would have been in other situations, and uh, I just could not swing the uh, cost of it. But they do have a film, video, new media, and animation department. Uh, they do offer, uh, let's see, uh, interdisciplinary courses over a broad spectrum, including cinema, digital video, time-based installation, and new media. Um, so it's, I mean, it's t t basically, you can do animation, you can do filmmaking, you know, standard, uh, you know, go out there and make a movie, but then they also do a lot of the stuff, um, like art installation pieces of video, where stuff is projected on walls and you move through it. Um, some of the interactive stuff that you see nowadays, where people take, like, a connect and they hack it. Uh, and so as people walk through the exhibit, the, the video changes around them and all that kind of stuff. So not just film, there's also kind of that fine arts uh, look at interactive video and video display and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, they do, if you do want to make movies, uh, they do offer that as well. And you're going to learn a lot, I, I think a lot more creativity than you would at like a regular film school. That's, you know, a regular film school is going to teach you everything you're going to get here, but I think if you go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and learn about film, you're going to, because they do installation pieces, museum pieces, uh, things like that, new media, uh, time-based installation, all that kind of stuff, that you're actually going to get a different look at how to use some of these things. Now, you may hate movies that are like this, but for instance, Pi uh, that came out, oh, gosh, maybe 15, 20 years ago now, um, that that treat film a little differently than kind of your standard storytelling. Um, maybe you like it, maybe you hate it, but that type of stuff is going to come out of one of these type environments. So I would say take a look at it. If you've got good grades, I mean, they do have financial aid available, <laughs> but um, I was not a very good student, and so it was not uh, readily available for me. So, uh, yeah. Um, but do be prepared. You're, you know, living downtown in the city. If you can find somebody to live with, you know, I, you, you can have roommates and whatever. Um, living downtown, it's just there's a lot of expenses from living in the city that just make it, you know, uh, expensive. So. All right, so there's that. Um, all that stuff, um, you know, just kind of the top news. Get that out of the way. We'll talk about Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for a few minutes here. But first, I'm going to take a sip of coffee from my new coffee cup. I, I'm going to have to post a picture of this somewhere, uh, maybe show it off in a video or something. I got a new coffee mug. And, and uh, let me just start by saying that coffee mugs to me are very important. I drink a lot of coffee. I love coffee. Um, I, I don't like flavored coffee. I don't like iced coffee. I don't like cinnamon mocha coffee. I don't like vanilla hazelnut coffee. Um, I just like, I like beans and hot water is my favorite flavor of coffee. And I got this new coffee mug. I, I love getting coffee mugs because I love drinking coffee so much. And this thing is ginormous. This is a Pac-Man uh, coffee mug that I ordered simply because I was like, oh, cool, Pac-Man. And it's got two screens taken directly from the game, printed on the mug, and then you've got the Pac-Man logo going down the middle. And, um, I, I, like I said, I just ordered it because it's Pac-Man, and I was like, okay, cool, whatever. I get this thing, and it's like, like the diameter on this is maybe 15 inches. Um... No, not diameter. <laughs> circumference. See, bad student in school. There you go. Circumference is like maybe 15 inches or, or so. Um, it, I mean, it's this is like bigger than your average bowl of soup, this gigantic thing. This is like a planter. Like, I could put uh, a hibiscus plant in here and grow this thing. And I don't even know what a hibiscus plant is. I just like saying the word hibiscus, so that's the one I chose. So I have this giant uh, coffee mug I'm going to take a sip out of. And it does, because it's so huge, uh, it does keep the coffee warmer longer, because uh, I do like myself some hot, hot coffee. And not, well, I shouldn't say not in the Grand Theft Auto way. That's some pretty good hot coffee, too. Um, but not what I'm talking about. All right. Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. 
the show, uh, of course, was a runaway success. It was a huge blockbuster. Got great ratings. But I felt overall, as a pilot, it was somewhat lacking. Um, for me, it didn't seem like there was really enough what I call heat. Uh, there wasn't really enough drama, I felt. You didn't have a character in peril that you necessarily cared about that drew you into the story. Uh, they introduced all these different characters and each had their own kind of tiny little subplots running through it, but none of them really took focus enough that you connect with the character to pull you through the show. So at the end of the show, really, there's no one in danger except for the guy with superpowers that they're trying to track down. He's the only one whose life is really kind of on the line. And you don't necessarily like the guy. I mean, he seems okay, but he signed up for this drug as part of this experiment that's giving him these superpowers. It's going to overload his body and make him explode. Uh, so, you know, he's a ticking time bomb. And they have to stop him. They figure out, can they stop him? Or are they going to have to, uh, you know, try to shoot him before he explodes on everybody? Whatever. <sighs> but... Uh, you just, I don't know, I just felt like I didn't really care about this guy a whole lot. Um, there were no other heroes, really, from the Marvel Universe. Um, you had uh, Colby Smothers um, who played Maria Hill. She made an appearance in there. And there are points where they're walking through um, the S.H.I.E.L.D. bases or, or, you know, they're talking about superheroes and you see, like, TV footage that's from the Avengers movie where you see like the Hulk, you see Iron Man flying through the sky, whatever. But none of those people appear in this. There's no Nick Fury in this and no other superheroes make any kind of appearance. There's no, not even like Pace Pot Pete in the background of a scene. No stilt man trying to get away. You know what I mean? Like nothing about this screamed Marvel Universe except for these kind of vague things and you had Agent Coulson there. And whether or not Agent Coulson can carry a series, you know, I don't know. Maybe he can, maybe he can't. Uh, you don't really know watching this first episode. It, there's nothing that really makes him shine. There's a funny scene at the beginning where he's walking through a dark doorway and he says something ominous. Uh, and then he, you know, totally kind of metas all over it and, um, you know, mentions the fact that he did that. But I, I just... I, when I got done with the show, I didn't hate it, but I wasn't in love with it. And for a pilot, that's kind of a bad thing. The, the real question is, how many people are going to tune in for week two and week three? You know, uh, you'll have a lot of people tune in for a new pilot. Whether or not they come back is something else. And the key here is they've got to put some recognizable Marvel characters in it somehow uh, in order to keep kind of that fanboy nerd interest. Um... But yeah, it, it didn't really seem to have the focus it needed. really didn't seem to have that heat. Uh, there was nothing that was, <coughs> oh my gosh, I'm on the edge of my seat. I can't wait to see what happens next. You know, It was just kind of there and it happened. If this was a bonus on, say, the DVD for the movie, or the Blu-ray, you know, you buy the Blu-ray of Avengers and this was like this bonus thing they tacked on at the end, you'd be like, oh, that's so cool. They should make a show of this. But when this is the pilot episode of the new show that is such the big deal, uh, that they're talking about everywhere and they're pushing in so many different media outlets. Mm, I, I just couldn't help but feel a little let down by it. But, you know, again, well, I'll just have to wait and see what happens in week two, week three, and on from there. All right. Total nonstop action wrestling. Um, I, most of you know that I worked in professional wrestling for a few years. I worked, I think, overall about six years i worked as a professional wrestling manager uh which meant i was one of those guys like by the brain heenan captain lou albano i would run out there i would distract the referee i would uh um you know try to sneak a chair in when nobody's looking i would take a cheap shot at the guy and then usually i would get beat up at some point um I, for a while i was also a booker uh for um a local group here in town new midwest wrestling so that meant that i was putting together well helping there were a couple of us working together and we would you know put together the storylines and uh develop some of the characters and do uh, some of that type of stuff uh, i did a lot of the audio visual stuff uh ran the entrance way we had a big video screen we had entrance videos for everybody we had the music i mean it was really uh i think i want to say really well done for being a show that you put on in front of you know 300 400 people 
Um, I think we did a really good job in it, regardless. So I've been a huge fan of wrestling for a long time. And WWE, over the last few years, I kept losing interest, but I kept watching. And it's one of those things where I didn't really like it. Um, <laughs> I wasn't really enjoying it anymore, but I was still watching it because it was the wrestling show. You know, it's what you watch. You want to watch wrestling, you're going to watch Raw. Everybody watches Raw. And earlier this year, it just got to the point, the, the stories were so nonsensical, the main events were the same people over and over, the, you know, I just needed a, I needed a break, I needed a change of scenery, I just needed something else. Um, I just felt it was insulting to a lot of the viewers, and I just couldn't really, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I wasn't even interested in the pay-per-views anymore, you know? It's one of those things where they're hyping the pay-per-view, and you're sitting there going, I've seen that match three times, I don't care. So, I stopped watching Raw. And I started watching ROH and TNA um, pretty regularly. ROH has kind of fallen on the wayside. We have a Sinclair station here in town, and they play it, but they've moved it to like 11:30 on Saturday nights or something like that. Uh, and so it's I'm I'm not always up to watch it because I'm getting old. You know, I'm not like the young guys. I can't stay up late and watch it. So I try to watch it online most of the time. Uh, but TNA I've been watching pretty regularly. And it's I'm not going to say that it's like the greatest thing of all time. By no means is that particularly true. But they have had a lot of good wrestling on their show. And one of the problems I've had with Raw for a long time is that especially when they went to three hours, it got even worse. But you know they'll do a show... And if you break it down into segments, look at the per hour. You watch the per hour, and there's two matches, maybe three. And if they do have a third one, it's like a one-minute squash. And then the other two matches that'll be on there, really not that good. And a lot of times, even if it's two matches in an hour, one of those matches will be a four-minute match. Uh, the other one will be like a seven-minute match. So you're getting like 11 minutes of wrestling in the 44 minutes that they produce in an hour. Three hour show, you get about a half hour of wrestling. And out of those matches, maybe one of them is a 15, 20 minute match. The rest of it is all the skits and the promos and the recaps of you know something that happened on SmackDown or the recap of what happened at the pay-per-view and all this stuff that I, I just... I, I, I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, so I, I stopped watching. I started watching TNA. And TNA does have its problems. Uh, and there were some... The show that was on last night had some really big problems in it as well. But it also had some really good wrestling matches in it. So I'm going to do a quick rundown of Impact from last night. Uh, talk a little bit about what I liked, what I didn't like. And then, you know, if you guys... Um, if you watched it, um, you know, you want to have your say, feel free to leave me some feedback. If, uh, you know, you have thoughts on TNA in general, if you've got any questions or things like that, you know, feel free to leave those and we'll, we'll try to get them answered. But I have been watching the show regularly, uh, and I have been enjoying it a lot more than I was enjoying Raw. Again, I'm not going to say that it's technically a better show. I mean, it's a smaller show. It's in smaller arenas. Uh, they obviously don't have the roster. Um, they're having some financial problems right now, and you know there are some issues with it. Uh, but overall, I am enjoying watching TNA more than I was enjoying wrestling when I was watching Raw. And so, anyway, I'm, maybe I'm just too old school now that I'm an old man, but all right, we'll get on with it. Uh, this is TNA Wrestling from last night. TNA Impact on Spike TV. This was September 26, 2013. Um, let's see. We had Dixie Carter um, backstage. Uh, she Sting came up to her and basically wondered why she hadn't returned any of his text messages. So she wasn't returning his calls. She referred to her in the third person, said that Dixie Carter will worry about T Dixie Carter or, or Dixie Carter take care of Dixie Carter's business or something like that. Uh, she knows what she's doing with AJ Styles, and she you know walked off, and uh, Sting looked upset. It was one of those kind of opening, you know, two-minute things, whatever, one-minute thing at the beginning, and it was fine. It was short. It was quick. It made its point. It moved on. It didn't linger too long, and so that was okay. 
that the aces and eights came, uh, came out. Bully Ray came out with uh, Miss Tess Mocker, who's now his girlfriend. And um, basically, he said how wonderful she was again at the expense of the, re of the rest of the guys in aces and eights. So those guys came down. Um, Nux, who is Mike Knox from ECW back in the day, uh, which I say back in the day, which is WWE CW. Um, Mike Knox, now known as Nux, came out, called Miss Tessmacher a hoe, um, basically said that uh, Bully Ray isn't worried about the guys in Aces and Eights anymore, started a hoe chant with the crowd. Um, Knox basically said that since they're facing the main event mafia in the main event tonight, um, they got to take care of club business, and it sucks because they can't count on Bully Ray anymore. And Bully Ray basically pointed out, you got to remember, I got rid of D'Lo Brown. I got rid of Mr. Anderson. Um, I can get. I got rid of Devon. So basically, any of you lose the match tonight, you're fired. You're out of aces and eights, which is kind of counterintuitive because if they're having a problem uh, with keeping... With, with winning matches and, and, you know, overloading the, the good guys, then shouldn't they have more bad guys? Shouldn't they be recruiting and not kicking people out? But whatever. Regardless, um, it looks like what they're doing is they're basically getting ready to tear apart Aces and Eights, which Aces and Eights has had a long enough run. They've been a stable long enough. They were, you know, on top for a long time, and now chopping them up, cutting them apart, fine. That's, uh, that's what needs to be done. Storylines move forward, so there we go. They had a segment in back where Joseph Park was about to shave, and Eric Young came up and stopped him and warned him. You know, he's like, like there are civilians here. I don't want you to do this. Uh, if you get cut, you start bleeding. You're going to go crazy and turn into abyss. And Joseph Park acted like he, he didn't know anything. What, like, what is Eric Young talking about? I don't know what happens. But, you know, if you've been watching TNA, Abyss, their mankind uh, ripoff type guy, uh, he gave up the mask. He he thinks he's his brother, who's a lawyer in a law firm, and um, kind of let himself get fat. Uh, but he still wrestles pretty well, and he's uh, he wrestles as like this kind of goofy guy. But then he bleeds at some point, sees the blood, it freaks him out. He turns into abyss, and then he just decimates everybody. It's it's a fun character. It's a comedy character. You know, this is the Funkasaurus of TNA, if you will. Um, but still, they had a match. It was uh, ODB, Joseph Park, Eric Young, and they were taking on the Bromans and Gail Kim. If you're not familiar with the Bromans, the Bromans are basically um, Zack Ryder in WWE. Instead of it just being one guy, they got two guys. And so, um, I, I mean, this was a comedy match. This is what it's supposed to be. Um, and it was fine for what it was. You know, it was... Um, you know, mixed tag match. Um, anytime you've got ODB and Eric Young, there's going to be comedy. Joseph Park is comedy. Bromans are comedy. Gail Kim, not necessarily comedy, um, but, you know, she played the part that she was supposed to find. And uh, basically ended with um, uh, Eric Young doing the Randy Savage uh, elbow on uh, Robbie E. And uh, ODB did a splash, pinned him, and won the match. It was not, you know, anything fantastic, but it was a fun thing. It was especially, you know, if you've got the 14-year-old you know, kid, you know, whatever, want to see something funny, and, you know, it's just a fun little thing like that. Um, they did a short little thing with Austin Aries in back, uh, doing a photo shoot for ImpactWrestling.com. It was just to basically plug the website. Um, but he said that he would announce later his future plans. No big deal. Had Hulk Hogan backstage so that he would talk about what's going on with AJ Styles and Dixie Carter later that night. Um, both of these, they were short, to the point, um, not really drawn out super long so again as opposed to wwe you get some of those backstage segments that are like seven minutes long 12 minutes long uh at least these are short uh to the point and i enjoy that a lot better uh austin aries came out to the ring was talking about how great he was um he talked about how he's not in the main event for bound for glory but you know he's still a top guy whatever tried to sell himself kenny king made his return he said that um you know, basically wanted to have a fight with Aries, so the two of them started, you know, throwing punches at each other, turned into a match, referee came running out, bell starts, and the two of them, <coughs> they start fighting, it goes to a commercial, they come back, and Kenny King is covered in blood. 
Um, he he was busted open hard way. <laughs> he was just bleeding buckets, and it was everywhere. And they just said, you know, screw it, we got to continue wrestling. So they kept doing their match, and um, it was great. Um, this was actually a really good match. Went about five minutes, but it was uh, high action, high intensity. They did a lot of really good stuff in this match. Uh, really enjoyed it. And um, Austin Aries um, did a drop kick, followed with the brain buster, got the pin on Kenny King. Uh, let's see. They talked about uh, the new um, knockout who's coming. She beat uh, Ivelise, Ivelise, whatever her name is, in the gut check thing. Um, she's um, laid something i forget but anyway she's uh i think filipino uh and is coming to uh knockouts later on they had saban and aries backstage um kind of having a bit of a face off the tension between them um and uh basically just setting up for something in the future between the two of them again short to the point it worked Main Event Mafia were backstage. Magnus was talking about how uh, Ego, the extraordinary gentleman's organization, is getting underneath his skin. That's the, the other heel faction in TNA that's starting to build. Um, Samoa Joe and Sting told him not to you know, worry about it. you got to get over it and move on. Kind of put a little bit of tension there, but I don't think it's really anything to worry about right now. Hulk Hogan, this is one of the big problems of the night. Hulk Hogan came to the ring to say that he was going to call out AJ Styles and Dixie Carter and get to the bottom of the situation, talk to the crowd a little bit about how much they liked AJ Styles, and then he left. Like, he basically came to the ring to say that he's later on going to come to the ring and deal with the situation. And it, I, I, the only thing I can think of is they wanted people to plant in their mind that you have to stay until the end of the show and watch that last segment. But most people watching TNA, uh, if you look at the ratings on the show, most people do watch, who watch regularly, watch every week, and they watch every minute. Um, they don't have a lot of the same ups and downs that Raw has because it doesn't have that same casual audience flipping channels who come in and go out of the show. Um, so I'm not really sure why they did it except maybe they thought they needed to fill time but then they ran out of time later which we'll talk about in a little bit um they announced that kurt angle will be returning at bound for glory so we'll have that to look forward to there's another vignette for another new wrestler coming this one just somebody named ethan um and i have to say that one of the problems when i looked at tna kind of long term is that they have this problem of cultivating new talent it's the same problem that wwe has and tna has that exact same problem and nxt is supposed to open those doorways for wwe but it hasn't really happened the way they thought it would and at least tna they're kind of in a cash crunch now uh, guys like devon and ken anderson they've left the company not because um, they got a better offer to go somewhere else or um, you know, they're, they're going back to WWE or anything like that. It's because TNA couldn't really afford them anymore. And they had to cut jobs, uh, cut slots in order to save money. And so what they're having to do now is they're cutting some of the older people and hiring new young people in order to save some money. So they have people on the roster but they're getting in some new blood. And that is desperately what they need. They need to bring in some new people. They need to pump them up. They need to give them a bunch of wins and make people care about them. And, uh, you know, hopefully that this turnover of getting rid of the WWE cast-offs and bringing in that new talent uh, is going to help them to, uh, you know, build up and kind of create their own identity as opposed to, becoming what WCW was at the time that they closed of being all the people that couldn't get a job in WWE uh, or what TNA was when it started basically um, they showed AJ Styles uh, backstage he said he wanted to hear Hogan out and he would go down to the ring when Hogan called him short to the point loved it uh, they had Manic versus Chris Sabin, another uh, almost six-minute match. It was not as good, I don't think, as the other one, but it was still okay. Um, one of the problems is uh, they had some funny, uh, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it, but like uh, Manic went to do the, um, oh, what's it called? 
catapult uh, where he grabs Saban's legs and he falls down backwards and it's supposed to lift Saban up in the air so Saban flies into the turnbuckles. It's a move that physics totally does not uh, apply to this move. This is a total pro wrestling move, not a sports thing. Um, but he basically, you know, he fell backwards to, to pop up Chris Saban and he gave Saban absolutely no room to move. Um, so <laughs> Saban kind of flipped up and realized he was standing right there at the turnbuckle. So then he basically had to leap straight up in the air and bring himself down on the turnbuckles instead of, you know, catapulting across several feet. So looked a little goofy, but did the best they could with it. Kind of funny. Um, you know, probably since I watch it a little differently than most people, I enjoy seeing kind of stuff like that come out of nowhere, watching how they try to work with what they have and recover as best they can. Um, but basically, um, Velvet Sky, who's ringside, uh, Chris Saban grabs her, gets her involved. Um, Austin Aries ran out, and he got involved. Um, and basically, um, it's, it's, it works against Saban in the end. Uh, he tries to go for a schoolboy. Manic reverses, gets the pin, and there you go. So uh, it was all right. They showed Aces and Eights backstage. Um, Nux, Bischoff, and Briscoe were all talking about how they can't lose another guy. They're upset, so they got to make sure they win tonight. They showed uh, Ego backstage, the Extraordinary Gentleman's Organization. They were watching the uh, Kurt Angle video package. They were upset that he's in the Hall of Fame. They're making this big deal about him. Uh, Bobby Roode... Um, you know, basically goes off on this thing about all these guys deserve to be in the Hall of Fame before Kurt Angle. And so basically what it turns into is they realize that Magnus is kind of the weak link right now. He's the younger guy. They're going to go after him. They're going to try to make him lose in the match so he can lose some of his confidence. Uh, Daniels and Kazarian start laughing like Dr. Evil uh, from the Austin Powers movie. Uh, but Bobby Roode, he gets kind of pissed off and he walks away. So... Bobby Roode doesn't really fit with these guys anyway, but they're, you know, trying to work together because they're all villains, so we'll see what happens. Main Event Mafia versus Aces and Eights. This went about 10 minutes. Um, it, they basically, the, the crowd wanted to see Sting come in. Um, and instead they had Magnus out there, and they had Magnus fighting with everybody. And, um... Magnus was actually doing all right until all the guys started to get involved. Um, Ego ran down. They grab Magnus. They throw him uh, out of the ring onto the floor. So Magnus starts selling this injury, and he has to be carried off. Uh, so they're playing up an injury angle with Magnus. He's out of the match. It's a two-on-three handicap match now. Um, Sting goes in, so the crowd's happy. But then, you know, he can't keep up against, uh, you know, the three other guys. So he's getting beaded on beat it on beaten on <laughs> and uh joe gets the hot tag um starts cleaning everything you know cleaning everybody out um starts uh switching all the momentum sting comes back in does a sp st uh, stinger splash uh on both of the guys joe picks up briscoe uh puts him in the clutch briscoe taps so briscoe is now out of aces and eights now the thing is he's fired um, main event mafia leaves bully ray comes out aces and eights he wants them to beat up briscoe take off his vest he's out of the group he's fired as far as i know briscoe is not fired from the company this is just a storyline thing they they did that with anderson and devon saying that they're fired from the group in order for those two guys to leave the company like that's they were going to be leaving the company anyway so they just had them lose the matches you know they're out of aces and eights and then they just straight up disappear from tna completely as far as i know briscoe is not actually leaving tna uh he is just out of aces and eights so it looks like not only is the group going to implode but you may get a couple of the guys i'm guessing like nux and briscoe will turn on Bully Ray. It's a question of whether they can get Bischoff to go along with him. Um, this may call for the return of Eric Bischoff, which, eh, whatever. Um, but at least if the team breaks apart, it makes sense that these guys are going to be upset from being you know pushed out of the club and they can do something. I, I don't want to see Briscoe go away. Uh, I think he's been good in TNA. I'd hate to see him you know be gone forever, but... 
uh, I guess you just have to wait and see what happens. Um, Hulk Hogan came out, introduced AJ Styles, uh, basically offered him a new contract. Styles kind of looked at it for a couple seconds, like maybe he was having second thoughts, but he signed it. He was happy baby face. Um, he's kind of back, you know, to the company, golden boy uh, type of thing. So that whole dark period with AJ Styles is done. Dixie Carter comes out. Um, she is total heel now. She rips up the contract. She tells Hogan he can't make these types of contracts. He's just the hired help to come work for her. Um, basically kicks AJ to the back and says, you know, if you're going to get a contract, I'm going to figure it out or something. I forget exactly, but whatever. Tells him to leave the ring. She um, talks about how she's part of the 99%, or she's part of the 1% that makes the world happen. Um... She goes, uh, signing AJ Styles to a new deal was basically a mistake that Hogan shouldn't be making, and Hogan's got to decide if he's going to be with Team Dixie or if he's going to be fired and leave the company, and she's going to give him until next week to figure it out. And then she storms off. So basically, they're, they're you know, doing this whole thing where they're going to put tension in between Hogan and Dixie, and for what it's worth and what it comes down to, with TNA's monetary problems, there is a very real chance that Hogan is leaving the company. Um, he was brought in in 2010, I believe. Uh, they made a big push. They realized that they, they just couldn't grow the way they wanted to, so they kind of backed off. If you remember, they were doing live on Monday nights up against Raw for a while. It just didn't work out, so they kind of backed off of that. They love having Hogan there because Hogan is wrestling. I mean, really, if you're outside of wrestling looking in at wrestling, you might know Stone Cold, you know The Rock, you know Hulk Hogan. You know, those are the names. And with him being affiliated with TNA, uh, it, it's a big deal as far as marketing goes, as far as advertising goes, as far as trying to get like video game deals and trading card deals and action figure deals. You know, Hogan is a big part of that overall package. They don't want to lose him, but he costs a lot of money. And there are rumors that they are trying to sell the company. Panda Energy owns TNA Wrestling. Um, they bought the majority share however many years ago, whatever. Uh, and it looks like they may be looking for someone to sell it to. They'd like to sell it to, I believe it's, is it Universal? Universal, who runs Spike? Whoever runs Spike, Viacom. Is it Viacom? Oh, God. I've got my multimedia conglomerates uh, messed up. Um, but basically, they want to sell the company to whoever owns Spike TV. Maybe it's Viacom. Um, because they bought Bellator, which is the MMA company, which is why you saw Tito Ortiz um, and um, uh, who's the other guy? Rampage Jackson. They were both in TNA briefly uh, a month or so ago. Uh, they bought Bellator in order to have Bellator original MMA programming for the channel. So it looks like they kind of want to sell TNA also so that Spike TV owns TNA and it's their you know flagship wrestling show. As far as the show goes, it makes sense for the network because it gets higher ratings than the network average. You know, Spike TV does normally like a .6. Uh, TNA is pretty much 1.0 or higher, uh, so it's better than the network average, um, but it's not, you know, WWE is getting three and a halfs and fours and sometimes even a five if The Rock returns before WrestleMania, things like that. So uh, it, it makes sense that they, they want to sell it to the network, but Hogan's contract is so expensive, they've kind of got him at this teetering point in his renegotiations to sign up because they can go to the network and say, well, if you want Hogan, you know, we can give him this contract and he'll be there and you're guaranteed to have him to remain as the figurehead for the show. But if he's too expensive and you want to cut costs, we do have this storyline where we can cut him out. So that's kind of what they're doing here is they're kind of teasing Hogan leaving the company and his contract is, you know, open for renegotiation, for re-signing. Um, all that stuff. They may not re-sign him in order to save the money, but they might if whoever is looking at buying TNA wants to keep him there. So teasing Hogan leaving is actually kind of 
more than just this random storyline. He very well may leave TNA and not be there anymore. Whether that means anything to you as a viewer, you know, I don't know. That's your call. Um, I personally would like to see him go and just like to see them focus on the new younger, you know, guys bringing the new talent, the interesting stuff, not worry about some of these old guys as much. But, I mean, you know, it is what it is. He is who he is, and he's a major reason that a lot of people watch. Guys like Scotty Cash, they'll go out every week, look for uh, Hulk Hogan merchandise that they can buy. So say your prayers, take your vitamins, do your training, I guess. All right, guys, well, that's going to do it for TNA, and that's what happened last week. So, um, like I said, if you got any questions, comments, feel free to leave them. You can go to jointheforums.com. You can find me uh, on Twitter, at PCN underscore dirt. Uh, you can send me an email, dirt at popculturenetwork.com. Find me on Facebook. It's actually facebook.com slash losers because that's our video game site. Um, that's what Pop Culture Network all kind of grew out of. Um, you can find me on Google+. Plus. Just do a search for Doug Dirt Turner. Uh, you'll find me on there. And anyway, guys, just keep watching the website. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you guys next time.